Today is November the 3rd, 2011, a Thursday, and the subject of our interview is a lawyer named Bill Carpenter. Um, Bill, I know from our preliminary discussion, you have some things you want to talk about, the differences in the way law was practiced when you began and the way it is practiced today, but let's set the stage for our listeners by talking a little bit about you. Okay. You were born and grew up in Nashville. Your father was an attorney. Uh, talk a little bit about growing up in Nashville and where you went to school. I know you and Claire live in a lovely section of uh, Nashville just off of Woodmont Boulevard and Hillsborough Road, not too far behind Woodmont Christian Church where Claire's daddy was a minister for a number of years. So. That's our background. Now you talk about what okay. it was like to grow up here. Well, actually, <clears throat> I've lived all my life within a very small area, within about a three-mile radius of where I live now. Um, two years I was in the Navy, and other than that, I've lived in Nashville. I've been to three schools in my life. MBA, Woodmont Grammar School, MBA, and Vanderbilt Undergraduate School, and uh, Law School and Undergraduate School. I've lived, I counted only seven houses in my life, including the one in New York when I was in the Navy. And uh, I have uh, four children, uh, three are living. Russell was killed in an automobile accident some years ago, and uh, I have gr nine grandchildren and one wife. <laughs> and it would be safe to say that if she were not 100% mentally healthy, we <laughs> wouldn't have made it this far. But um, in case you're counting on your fingers, I was born in 1929, so I'm 82. We were married in 1951 and that's 60. So um, we've been together a long time, and I asked her to come today. She says she's not going to talk, but she can if she wants to. Uh, schools, you didn't have to take any admission for any schools. MBA, you just signed up. If you graduated from the eighth grade, you went. Vanderbilt uh, Undergraduate School, I just went over there and talked to the register, and uh, you had to have graduated from high school and you were admitted. I don't think it was quite that easy, but there weren't any tests. Uh, if you graduated from MBA, you were admitted, I think. And um, then when I got ready for law school, I went up and talked to Dean Forrester at the law school, and no test, and he talked to me about different law schools. and. He says Tulane's a good one, and Duke's a good one, and University of Virginia's good. He says, but I, we think we have a good law school here. I said, well, I believe I'll just go here. So <laughs> it was that easy. You mentioned that you were in the Navy for yeah, two years. I was. Uh, how, how, how did you come by joining the Navy? Oh, it was during the Korean War, mm -hmm. and uh, I would have been uh, drafted uh, several of us signed up for Naval Reserve, and uh, then we got an opportunity to go to officer training school in the summers while we were in Vanderbilt. And the uh, result of that, uh, I went for two years just before the Korean War was over. I served on a ship that was stationed in the Brooklyn Navy Yard and uh, it was a good experience, and we kept the Atlantic safe for those of you back at home. So, uh, uh, when you got to Vanderbilt Law School, you mentioned Dean Forrester. Was, uh, Dean, was he Dean and a faculty member? He was. Uh, tell us a little about any faculty that made a particular impression on well, several did. becoming a lawyer. Uh, Dean Forrester left soon at, I think, after my, all right, after my freshman year in law school, I went in the Navy. And when I came back, Dean Wade was the 
uh, dean. And he made an impression. He was a good teacher. Paul Hartman was a good teacher. Mm -hmm. Eddie uh, Morgan. Morgan taught evidence and uh, civil procedure. He made an impression. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I'd be leaving out some. Uh, Troutman, Herman Troutman. Uh, we had a good faculty. I thought we had a good faculty. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned a lot in law school. It was, uh, Your father was already a practicing lawyer and had a firm, and you joined that firm immediately after graduation? Yeah. Well, that's sort of what sons did back then, mm -hmm. and um, that's what my son did. Mm -hmm. He practiced law for a while. So, um, and he's also Bill Carpenter. So... Um, yeah, that's what I did. I mean, there wasn't ever any thought. Uh, John, uh, George Kate was with his dad. Uh, Jack Norman Jr. was with his dad. You know, it just sort of what you did. Yes. And it was fine. Um, talk a little bit about the law firm. I mean, did you take only certain kinds of cases? Did you just take... Uh, whatever cases you all could uh, could round up. Uh, just tell <laughs> well, us Diane, a little bit about that. It was, um, back then was a general practice. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of us had what you might think of as a type practice that lawyers in small towns would have now, um, where you did a little bit of everything. Uh, draw, write a will, a contract, write a deed, uh, form a corporation, and try lawsuits. Uh, I'm sure there were other things, but that's sort of the general nature of our practice. I didn't do any criminal work. Uh, I didn't do any divorce work. But that was just my choice not to. And um, the people in our office did. The law firms were small then. Uh, most of us were within a block or two of the courthouse. You thought you had to be near the courthouse then. And um, the Stallman Building, the American Trust Building, the uh, Nashville Bank and Trust Company Building, and some as far away as the Commerce Union Bank Building. Mm -hmm. So. Um, most of us in the American Trust Building had one floor, which meant we had about eight or nine or ten lawyers. And uh, it was, uh, I don't know when, but whenever they built the um, first American Bank Building, what's that called now? I don't know. It's something else. Regions? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. It's had several names. Yeah. So um, the large firm started expanding mm -hmm. and started specializing. <clears throat> if I get a little of that coffee, I might get this husk out of my, out of my voice. But go ahead. Uh, well, this, this is probably a good, a good place uh, to, for you to talk about the changes yeah, okay. and, and the differences in the practice of law. You've already pointed out some you were all within a block of each other, yeah. and and you knew each other. We knew each other. I was. There were 500 lawyers then. We had a, a picture that had all the lawyers' names, and I would say there were about 500. And I knew all of them, and they knew me after a period of time. So you never passed on, even those that were in government work, or those that worked for insurance companies or anything, you knew all of them. And that was unusual. I remember we moved to the new Commerce Union Bank building, uh, which is that triangular building up there. It's changed names since. And uh, thank you. And, uh, and I made my mind up that I was going to learn and meet all the lawyers in that building. And I never did. I mean, it just too many. They had spread out by then. But 
the main change that I think is the introduction of women into the law practice. That was amazing to me that there were three women who were lawyers that I can remember when I started practicing. Mildred Lund worked for Bolt Cummins, and uh, Rebecca Thomas worked with uh, Hugh Hauser and Connie Summers and that group. And uh, I guess uh, Doug Fisher was in that building. I don't know what offices they were all in. But uh, you'd know better than I, but uh, the number of women lawyers are, is improving by leaps, uh, increasing by leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm and maybe approaching 50 percent. The law schools probably are approaching 50 mm percent. -hmm. I think that's right. And uh, that's all been for the better. Um, so it's a shame. When I started practicing law, women didn't even sit on juries. So um, it was gentlemen of the jury. You know, when we got women, we had to make ourselves adjust to say, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. But uh, that was an improvement, too. And since then, 18-year-olds have been allowed to serve on juries, so that's an improvement. Um, specialization has come on slowly. I remember when uh, one lawyer said he was going to specialize in tax, and we thought, you can't make a living just doing that. But now if you don't specialize, you're in trouble. Um, advertising, large firms did not advertise them. And some of these things maybe I'll comment on a little bit later. But arbitration and mediation has taken over mm -hmm. and become uh, a part of the practice. And it had not, I've been retired 17 years. So uh, it was just starting to be a fact when I quit practicing. So I I can't really comment on it much. We didn't have paralegals. We didn't have interns. And so we suffered <laughs> by not having them, but, but um, we didn't. Let's see, I, I was looking at some notes. I, I've covered some of the things. Research has changed dramatically. I mean, the uh -huh. computer has is, uh, is caused uh, a big change there. Court reporters um, took everything down shorthand. Um, Mr. Fish and Ms. Draper were two, I remember, that just had a pen and a tablet and they went to work. And then came along the, excuse me, <coughs> the stenotype and uh, the Hicks brothers and, I mean, many more. Uh, they, uh, they came along, and now with all this technology like we're using here today, you know, the sky's the limit. I don't, um, I don't guess that Jim Val could take shorthand. You know, he probably couldn't. I don't know if he could run a steno machine, but um, it's, uh, it's much improved. We had manual typewriters. The secretaries had manual typewriters. Sure. Did you ever type on one? I did. Yeah. And if you wanted to make copies, you had to have carbon paper, mm -hmm. and um, and you had whiteouts, you know, or you usually had to start over. So um, then came along IBM Selectrix, yes. which was some improvement, but uh, and then word processors and. Uh, Xerox, we didn't have Xerox. We couldn't copy anything. So uh, air conditioning, why did that matter? It mattered to keep you cool, but we always kept our windows open. And if you didn't have paper weights on each <laughs> stack of paper, especially in the Stallman building, it would suck the papers out the window <laughs> and you'd be out of luck. So that was uh, that was some of the changes that I what about the rules, uh, court rules? Uh, do you remember, have, have you noticed that the rules that are employed by lawyers in trying cases uh, or filing uh, filings with the court, that, that those have changed 
uh, dramatically? Well, they have changed. Um, I, I was going to talk about some of the things that maybe I didn't agree with or that I had suggestions that be investigated as going back to the way it was. Um, one thing, um, I, I say that litigation and all legal matters now take too long and cost too much. Um, litigation, uh, there have been a lot of changes in order to try to speed up uh, litigation. And to me, it hadn't done anything but slow it down. Uh, and the prime example is uh, summary judgment. Uh, the first thing a lawyer does it now, not the first thing always, but they file a motion for summary judgment. Mm -hmm. And in order to prepare that motion, they take endless depositions uh, and they uh, file this motion and it takes them months to do it, and they're always overruled. So by then, the clients broke, and uh, <laughs> they have to start over to get ready for trial. I think this is part of the reason that, um, that arbitration and mediation mm -hmm. has come, become more prominent. Um, I'm one that believes that the, that the lawsuits are more orderly way to dispose of a real dispute. The pleadings set out what the, what the issues are and what, uh, what one side's claiming and what the other is denying. And then you have rules of procedure, and they, they are orderly. And then the rules of evidence. Uh, I don't know in arbitration and mediation if they limit themselves to any rules of evidence or not. I just don't know. But um, those are sort of out the window unless you're <laughs> trying a lawsuit. Uh -huh. I've heard that um, Kip Gaden hadn't tried <coughs> two lawsuits this year. He's a judge. I'm, I forget who I'm talking to. Who am I talking to? The Bar Association, they would know that, but layman might not. Um, so that's, um, that's sort of my ideas. I, I, while I'm on the idea of suggested changes, advertising, I have a question on that. Um, it's a fact the Supreme Court says lawyers can advertise, but some of it seems to me to be beneath the dignity of the profession. Mm -hmm. And I think that the Bar Association or the court should say that there are certain restrictions. And I, I wouldn't want to try to pronounce what those should be, but um, I think it sort of cheapen the profession, some of them do. Mm -hmm. And then the question of hourly charging came to my mind. Um, corporations sort of put us in the mode of charging by the hour. And um, it's, it made lawyers become sort of uh, like a taxi cab meter, you know, you just... Uh, and making money got to be the primary goal, which really it shouldn't be. Uh, it's a goal, but not the primary goal. Um, so uh, we, before we had charging by the hour, we um, would pay attention to the amount involved and the ability of the client to pay. Uh, too often people are out of court now before they can get in or out of hiring a lawyer before they can hire them because... Well, well on that point, Bill, back when, when you were first 
uh, practicing law. How, how, what was the representation for what we call today the indigent? Uh, was there already a, um, a legal aid? Did, did people do a lot of pro bono work? Were they appointed by courts to take certain matters? How did that work? Well, the appointments would have come in criminal court. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can't really answer that. I know there were lawyers that hung around the criminal court waiting to be appointed. And they would sometimes get a fee out of it. Uh, it was uh, even lawyers who later became rather prominent and successful would uh, just sit around General Sessions Court and Criminal Court. But I didn't observe that much firsthand. But there was a lot of pro bono work. Um, and my recollection is, it's been a while, but and memory fades, but my, my recollection is that you went to the Bar Association office and they had a list of lawyers who were willing to do pro bono work and they would call and send the person over. And usually it was something that a little advice would help them, you know. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, you mentioned a moment ago that law firms did not have paralegals or interns. Yeah. But now, when we were, when we were discussing um, this interview earlier, you mentioned that Frank Clement, oh. the former governor, well, he did. Uh, had, had worked for your firm. Now, was he in law school at the time? He was in law school. Um, but he did do, I don't know what you'd call it, <laughs> errands. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and he did for Good Pasture Carpenter, and uh, he was he knew he was going to be a politician then, Diane, because now I don't know this because it was before I was practicing, but they would send him to the courthouse, and he'd be an hour or two getting back. <laughs> <laughs> he had to speak to everybody there, you know, and tell them his name, and and our law firm represented WLAC Radio. And um, from time to time, he would take papers there. And uh, that's where he met his wife. She was the receptionist at WLAC Radio. And um, so, Seal, Lucille. And um, so I don't know what he did, but he did something. And you also mentioned Jim Havern to me. He did the same thing. And whether, I don't know what he did research for them or uh -huh. errands or what, but uh, it was hard for a lawyer to get a law student to get a job working in a law office. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to completely leave the, the practice of law, but, le but just for the moment, at some point you decided that you would enter the legislature. Oh. And you'd been practicing... Mm, let's say five years. Yeah, about five years. Yeah. And so, uh, tell t tell us about your decision to run for the legislature, why you did it, and then let's talk a little bit about your um, your term in, in the legislature. Well, uh, when I was a senior in law school, Mr. Cecil Sims um, <clears throat> uh, taught a class on Saturday morning, not for credit, and uh, he could talk about anything he wanted to for an hour. And one time he talked about getting a job, uh, how to get on the first rung of a ladder, the ladder to, uh, he talked about uh, Alice in Wonderland one summer, one su uh, Saturday. And one Saturday he talked about politics, and he says, I recommend that every lawyer practice law for five years and then run for the legislature and not become a politician, but just run that one time, I think, for the experience. So it didn't make much impression on me. I wasn't a politician. I wasn't thinking about it. And um, so one day, Mr. Sims called me and says, Bill, I wish you'd come up here and talk to me. So I did. Uh, 
we were in the same building. And he says, I want you to run for the legislature now. Your time has come. So he was sort of picking the ticket, I think. He says, Frank Grell's going to run for the Senate, and Bob Taylor's going to run for the Senate, and Tom Shriver's going to run for the Senate. I want you to run for the legislature. So I went back and talked to the lawyers in my office. I was an associate, and um, they agreed for me to do it. The campaigning, Diane, was what meant the most to me. Um, back then, we ran countywide. Uh, it was the last legislature before they had districts. Okay. So we ran countywide, and the top eight or nine were elected. I, I told you once eight, but when I counted up, I think there were nine. And... Uh, and um, so I campaigned for about six weeks. I really worked at it. And you had to go all around the county. I did. And it was tiring, but it was also enjoyable and educational in the long did run. Did your family campaign with you? Oh, they did. Uh, yeah. Claire um, was a good campaigner. And... Uh, she uh, also did a lot of the paperwork. Like, we had somebody man every poll in the county, and she was helpful in getting that done. And um, then she'd go with me to barbecues and bingo parties and fish fries and uh, every, kind of, every kind of thing, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and just meet people and pass out cards and... And uh, so I did it and served. And the serving wasn't too important. What can a one-term freshman legislature do? Um, did the papers endorse you? Or were oh, papers well, uh, that was taking funny. endorsements back then? I don't then? know how much time we have, but... We that, have, we're fine. All right, we're doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Selman Evans had run the Nashville Tennessean for years and years and years. And Mr. Jimmy Stallman had run the banner. Now, there were others, but those two were the people in charge at each newspaper. And politically, they hated each other. They, they were always on opposite sides. And Mr. Evans had trained his son, Silman Jr., to uh, take over when he died and are retired. And um, Mr. Evans died, and then Silman Jr. died within a short time. And Eamon Evans, who really had no experience in the newspaper business uh, up to that time, was appointed to <coughs> president or publisher or mm -hmm. something or other, editor, and um, he picked certain of his friends, and they were very, very interested in politics. And um, so I interviewed with the editorial board of both newspapers, and I found out that uh, the Tennessean was only going to support about four or five people, not a full slate. And I wasn't one of them. So um, John J. Hooker Jr. was the lawyer for the uh, Tennessean. He was Eamon's friend. Um, one morning I was uh, out in, uh, in, in Donaldson and campaigning out there, and I called my office. We didn't have cell phones now. <laughs> <laughs> and I was told that the banner was trying to get in touch with me. They wanted to interview me. They were going to endorse me. And I already knew the Tennessee and wasn't. So I went. Uh, I, I told them I had to go to a lunch meeting, the Civitan or Sir Tom or something or other. And be introduced as a candidate. We, we did that then. And 
who was speaking but John Hooker Jr. And uh, so when he began his talk, he started out, now I don't know who the newspaper I'm going to, I represent is going to support, but for me, I'm supporting Bill Carpenter. <laughs> so, so I went back to the office, and I had a good friend at the Tennessean who was an editorial writer, Gene Graham, and I called Gene and uh, told him what John had said, and he said, well, stay where you are for a while. He went and talked to John Sigenthaler, who was the publisher or editor. I forget what their titles were but at the time. And Sigenthaler called John Jay and said, John Jay, did you say that? And he said he did. So Sigenthaler said, well, if he's good enough for you, he's good enough for us. So... <laughs> Um, so you ended up with the endorsement of the Tennessean. And Banner. And Banner. See, I'd already been told that oh, morning right. that Banner was going to endorse me. So if I had, if at the time it had been any different and one had found out about the other before they agreed to endorse me, I wouldn't have been endorsed. Now you mentioned uh, Frank Gorell and... Uh, yeah. And Tom Shriver and, and Bob Taylor. So they are the, they are the senators. So those, they selected the top three vote getters the, for who were running for the Senate. I don't know whether they spots. even had opposition or not. I don't know about that. Well, were there Republicans who who ran mm -hmm. back then, or was it all a? No, it was a Democratic primary that controlled it. Mm -hmm. And uh, who who else was elected when or in the were? House? Uh, Seth Norman, uh -huh. Jack Norman's son, Vaden Lackey, mm -hmm. John Kelly, Charlie Galbraith, and Lewis Pride, and myself, we were the lawyers. Now that means that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. And then nine lawyers were Jerry Atkinson, um, Gail Gupton, mm -hmm. and Mary Anderson. Mm -hmm. So that's nine. <laughs> So there were nine and three, and that was the Davidson delegation. Uh, you mentioned that legislators did not have, well, there wasn't a legislative plaza then, and no. I, I don't know if there were offices as there are now even in no. War Memorial. Where was your office as a legislator? Well, the, our delegation had two rooms uh, in the old... Uh, I don't know what the name of, not the Andrew Jackson Hotel, maybe the Andrew, Andrew Jackson Hotel. Mm -hmm. um, furnished, we, we didn't have metropolitan government then. They were furnished jointly by the city of Nashville and Davidson County, and they paid for us to have those two rooms. That was the nearest thing we had to an office. Did you have someone who answered the phone for the delegation? Yeah, or? we did. Uh, uh, Charlie Frazier, who's a lawyer, did more than just that. Mm -hmm. um, so, but he he was paid by those two uh, governments, mm -hmm. and he was a lot of help to us. Just out of curiosity, who was the Speaker of the House when you were in the House? Do you remember? No, I, I remember him. I can't remember. He just served one term. He mm -hmm. was from West Tennessee. He was excellent. I can't think of his name. Yeah. Uh, now, during, uh, help me here, was it during your campaign or during your term that you became aware of or acquainted with some of the more colorful characters in Nashville's yeah. political history? Well, <laughs> yeah, I guess this is of general interest, but... Uh, Charlie Riley was a councilman uh, in South Nashville. Mm -hmm. And when Metro was voted in, he decided he wasn't going to run for the council anymore. And um, a couple of people, or three people, a couple, I guess, announced to run for his position. It would have been in the new Metropolitan Government Council. And he was asked uh, 
at one time said, Charlie, who are you supporting? Well, Charlie, okay, Charlie was supporting Carlton Loser for Congress, and Dick Fulton, who was a neophyte, a beginner in politics, was running against Carlton Loser. Carlton Loser was then the district attorney. And Charlie Riley and Carlton Loser were friends, and he was uh, supporting Carlton Loser. So, ha having said that, Riley, when asked who he was going to support, said, Well, I think I'm probably going to support Gene Jacobs. He's the lesser of two evils. So, Gene Jacobs got the nickname right there, Little Evil. <laughs> and he, he went through the rest of his life being Little Evil. Uh, he, uh, he wanted to please Charlie Riley. And so he became anxious to get all the votes for Carlton Loser that he could. And back then, councilmen, uh, not so much for their own benefit, but they would have a slate of people that they were supporting um, in all elections. And I think it was more because their constituents would say, well, I don't know who's running for the legislature. Who should I vote for? Uh -huh. And they would have it printed up, just a little uh, piece of paper with the names of who they were supporting. And, of course, Carlton Loser was the head of, of um, Charlie Riley's list. But then he had Gorell down and Shriver and Taylor, and, and I was on the list, too. I didn't know it till later. But Gene Jacobs was a notary public, and I don't know. I should have looked this up, but he went around to people in the South Nashville area, which is... The area is sort of 4th and 2nd Avenue out toward the fairgrounds. And he would get people in that district to vote absentee. You're supposed to vote absentee if you were out of town or sick or something like that, but a lot of these people never voted, and they maybe some of them couldn't even read. So when the absentee ballots came, Gene Jacobs would go and vote for them. And then, for some reason, they had to be notarized. Um, well, Carlton Loser got all the votes. I think he gave a couple to Fulton. I th <laughs> think he wanted to be fair and gave a couple to Fulton. But Jacobs got, I mean, uh, uh, Carlton Loser got all the votes. I was on there. I got all the votes. I didn't know it till after the election. The Tennessean found out, and they had been for Fulton. And so they were very much disturbed by the fact that this had happened. Carlton Loser made a mistake, I think, politically, because he claimed that he would have been elected even if he had not gotten these little evil votes. But that wasn't good enough for the Tennessee, and so they, for some reason or other, they had another election, and uh, Fulton won overwhelmingly. Okay. And uh, Gene Jacobs went to the penitentiary for a while. He came back, and he would have a Easter egg hunt every year out in the district where he had been councilman. Um, and he would come around to all the offices, including ours, getting donations for the Easter egg hunt. And the secretaries in our office would act like a celebrity has come in, you know. <laughs> Little evil's out here to see you. So that's, that's a story about I think I told you also about Good Jelly Jones. Um, we had a city judge back then, and Andrew Doyle was his name, and he lived in North Nashville. And Frances Doyle was his sister, and she lived in North Nashville, and she was on the city council. Mm. And Good Jelly Jones could always, good. it was said that Good Jelly Jones read what was known as a good time house. 
in North Nashville. And um, occasionally the police would take Good Jelly in and Judge Doyle would find some reason to dismiss the charge. <laughs> I'm not, I don't think anything unethical went on, but, but they were good friends and Doyle, the Doyles could depend on Good Jelly. And um, so I was told later that the brick that was in our house came from Good Jelly Jones's place when they tore it down. <laughs> now, now that's, a, that's a good story to know. <laughs> but we had, the, Frances Doyle had a supper out at her house uh, and her slate, and I was on her slate, um, her slate was invited out to the supper and then we were all required to, excuse me, <clears throat> to make a little talk. Uh, and you stood on the corner of a porch. The porch had two sides to it and you stood here and all the white people were in the front yard and all the blacks were in the side yard. And that shows how much we've changed. We still right. haven't changed enough, but at right. least we've changed. That well, wouldn't happen now. You know, these days it's very common to have barbecues or fish fries, oh, yeah. but, but they're fundraisers. Yeah. Now, were, were, would people throw money in a hat or, or make donations no, when they would come no. to these suppers, or was this just to get my, the message my out? My campaign didn't cost me anything, maybe a few dollars, but not really much, mm -hmm. 100 or two dollars. But these were like the... What, what's the name of that? Uh, supper we went to. Uh, possum. Oh, yeah. Uh, possum hunter supper. Wow. And you would just go because there'd be a group of people there. It wasn't a fundraiser. Right. Uh, ben Rest gave me a little money. Uh, Harlan Dodson, who was a lobbyist for somebody, gave me a little money. I think it's probably all of it. Uh, what other rest was my money? It was there much. any political advertising on radio? Yeah, I had a little spot on the television mm -hmm. for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and you had uh, bumper stickers and you had posters you could put in people's businesses' windows. Sure. Uh, yeah, it was uh, lower key than now. So you served one term. Yeah. And that was enough. Yeah, you. it was enough. Our legislature didn't do a lot. Um, we passed the uh, contract law, which was a standard contract law. We put a tax on professionals. We didn't do a lot. Uh, so, uh, so then you there. went back to your practice. I was practicing all the time. I would go to the office every day. We would start a session at about 10 o'clock. I'd be at the office at 8 and go um, up there and be back before the day was over. Another question about a difference possibly between law firms now and then. These days, a young person may join a firm and eventually find out that they either are or are not on a partnership track. Yeah. How how, how was that done when you, when you were you said you were an associate with the firm when you yeah. went to the legislature. Yeah. How was that done when you were practicing? Well, uh, my dad and Mr. Goodpasture decided. <laughs> Uh, maybe Bill Woods later had something to do with mm -hmm. it, but it was just, uh, they decided how much money you made, and they decided when you would become a partner. And so you became a partner. I did. <laughs> uh, let's talk about some of the cases that may be the most memorable uh, that, that you were involved with. Um, then I know you mentioned um, to me a case that you had. Um, um, you were representing a company, and I believe uh, Dick Frank was representing A. Cuff Rose. Yeah. Well, um, 
That had to do with the renewal rights for Hank Williams songs. And I should have looked this up too, but uh, I don't know how long a copyright is good for on a song, or was then. I think it was 70 years, but it was 35 and 35. You had to renew at the end of 35 years. And um, then there were companies, okay, let's see, how did I not get ahead of myself? Um, Hank Williams songs came up for renewal. And there was a question about whether Billie Jean Jones would share in those renewals as being a widow of Hank Williams. And the question was whether or not she was free to marry Hank. Um, so Audrey was not Hank's wife. They were divorced. There was no question about that. Mm -hmm. uh, Hank Jr. was uh, going to share 50 percent. I don't know whether it was the writer's rights or the, or the publisher's rights, but he was going to share 50. He was Hank's son. There was no question about that. But the question was whether or not Billie Jean would share the other half. Well, God, here's a story. <laughs> um, Billie Jean Jones Eshleman, Eshleman because she had been married to a soldier, lived in Bossier City, Louisiana. And the Louisiana Hayride was uh, at Shreveport. And Bossier City and Shreveport, you know this, yes. but they're right across the river from each other. They're just like East Nashville and downtown Nashville. So uh, Billie Jean would go to um, the Louisiana Hayride some, and um, one time Farron Young, who was singing on the Louisiana Hayride, was invited to come to the Grand Ole Opry as a guest. And he said to Billie Jean, who he's dating then, you want to go with me? And she said she guessed she did. So they got on the Brayhound bus and they rode to Nashville and they were on the Louisiana Hero, I mean the Grand Ole Opry. And there was off stage, there was a place where a guest could sit and that's where Billie Jean was. And while she was, while Farron was singing, Hank went over and introduced himself to Billie Jean and said, he, when, when, when Farron came back, says, Farron, are you going to marry this girl? And Farron says, he didn't know they hadn't talked about it. So <laughs> Hank says, well, if you're not, old Hank's going to marry her. So, <laughs> So they swapped dates that night, and they went out, and Billie Jean went with, with, uh, with Hank, and Farron took Hank's date, and they decided they would get married. Well, Billie Jean had this problem. She didn't know if she was divorced from Eshleman. Eshleman had been a soldier in Shreveport, and they had married and he had filed for divorce. She knew that. And then he had been transferred. So she didn't know if the divorce ever went through. And she didn't, wasn't sure where he'd been transferred. Uh, well, Hank sure wasn't going to marry any married woman. So he, he, he had his morals. And he wasn't going to marry any married woman. So they decided they would go back to Bossier City and Billie Jean would get a divorce. We tried and tried and tried to find any sign of the divorce papers and couldn't. Uh, Billie Jean was sure that he had filed, but in hindsight, I wonder if he ever did. But 
Anyway, they went back to Bossier City and they got a lawyer and they were going to, uh, he filed a divorce action for them. Well, the day came, let's see. Yeah, the day came for the hearing. This has been a long time ago, guy. <laughs> um, the day came for the hearing, and the judge called the lawyer up to the bench and said, you are supposed to have filed an interlocutory order 10 days before the divorce can be granted. And the lawyer hadn't done that. I think he was probably a pretty second-rate lawyer, and he hadn't done it. And he according to him, he said, well, Judge, the people are all here. Could we go on with the hearing today? And uh, then I'll file the interlocutory decree, and the marriage will become final in 10 days. The judge agreed to that. The big question was whether or not Billie Jean and Hank had heard that, or whether that was just between the judge and the lawyer. The judge was dead. Uh, the lawyer said uh, that only he heard it. Billie Jean and Hank, oh, well, Billie, Hank was dead, but Billie Jean said she never heard it. So this was on Friday. Well, they already had their marriage license to get married, even before the hearing. And they, on Saturday night, uh, Hank appeared on the Louisiana Hayride. And during that time, somewhere or another, he got word from Nashville, from Audrey, that if, she, oh, they also had arrangements to be married on Sunday on the stage of the city auditorium in New Orleans. So uh, Hank and Billie Jean, Audrey gets word of that, and she says, if, Hank, if you step on the stage with that woman, son, you're dead. So they tried to figure a way around that. I mean, that was a problem. So. Since they had their marriage license, they decided they would get married on Saturday night. So somebody knew a uh, justice of the peace who lived out in the country somewhere, and Hank got excused from the Louisiana Hayride, and they went out and they got married that night, Saturday night. Then Sunday, they had an airplane chartered to fly from... Uh, Shreveport to New Orleans, and they were married on stage at the city auditorium, but they had a sellout. So they had two performances, and they were married twice. <laughs> <laughs> twice in New Orleans, in addition to the ceremony or the justice of the peace yeah. in Shreveport. So they were married three times in two days. <laughs> But the question was, was Billie Jean free to marry? Right. If she knew that that divorce wasn't final, then she, well, so our lawsuit came up over. In, in Louisiana, which has laws different from everybody else, uh, they have what they call a putative marriage. If you, in good faith, believe that you are free to marry, then the court will honor that marriage for inheritance purposes. Mm -hmm. So we, our lawsuit was filed based on uh, a putative marriage. Plus, after that marriage, they lived for a while in Montgomery, Alabama, where Hank's mother had a boarding house, and they stayed in that boarding house, and we filed, on, and Alabama had uh, common law marriage. 
So we said that either it was a putative marriage or a common law marriage or both. And uh, so that's what that's what the lawsuit was about. And um, what was the outcome? The outcome was that she the, it was a putative marriage. Uh, and so she was entitled to yeah. uh, to uh, to share. Yeah. When the when the royalties were yeah. renewed. Later on a motion for a new trial, we tried this in federal district court here, and Judge Morton, who was a judge at the time, declared that there was sufficient evidence to declare that it was also a common law marriage. Mm -hmm. This was appealed and argued in um uh, oh, there were so many side issues in this. I'm, I'm staying, I'm trying to stay with... You're doing great. Yeah, I'm trying. But uh, it was appealed, and the Court of Appeals in Cincinnati affirmed Judge Morton, and they attempted uh, to go to the Supreme Court and then backed off. That never was pursued. Okay. So that was, um, I'd say, the most interesting. There were more facts in that than you'd ever hear. I mean, here's one little side fact, and then I hope I won't say any more. But, but there's always been the story that Hank and his group were coming back to Montgomery um, after a performance, late night performance, and uh, they got into Shreveport as the sun was coming up, and Hank had been asleep, and he saw the sun coming up and he wrote the song, I Saw the Light. Okay. Then there was a woman who lived next door to Hank's mother's uh, boarding house who took an interest in Hank and she told me that she t asked Hank to go with her one day to talk to his preacher. And he did. And uh, he was very impressed by what the preacher had to say, and he left there and went and wrote the song, I Saw the Light. So how, you know, I don't know. But Hank was an alcoholic from the very beginning. He was an alcoholic the whole time he and Billie Jean were married. Billie Jean later married Johnny Horton, who was a singer-songwriter. Oh, sure. And Johnny Horton died in an automobile crash coming back from a performance. So I told the jury, Judge Morton was strict on everybody's Mr. and Mrs. And I said, I hope the judge will excuse me this, but her name was Billie Jean Jones Eshleman Williams Horton. <laughs> <laughs> she had a lot of names. She still lives down there in Bossier City. We stopped through there oh, a few years ago and ate at a fish house, and I asked the woman that ran it if she knew, and she did. And Billie Jean still lives there. <laughs> well, that's enough stories but, about but, lawsuits. Well, uh, at some point, you got back into the practice of law in a different way, and that's where I met you. All right, that's you what I joined want to talk about. the attorney general's office. Maybe, um, maybe, all right. So you returned to state government just in a different capacity. Oh yeah. Uh, let's well, talk a little bit about that. You were a mentor to a lot of young lawyers, well, I some hope of so. whom had never. The been inside other, a courthouse. The courtroom. only other thing, I had some notes, as you can see, I've been shuffling, but I wanted to talk about how Frank Drewater got to be judge, but we'll do that later. Okay. And then, uh, well, you're right. Uh, uh, I was appointed or hired to be a lawyer at the Attorney General's office, and it was probably the best job I ever had. I remember I was on an uh, elevator one time with Doug Fisher, and Doug says, he was talking to somebody else, but he says, oh, to be an associate again. 
you know he's right. If you've got the management of a law firm on your hands and trying to be a lawyer, it's just, you'd just rather be a lawyer. And so that's what I was when I went back to the Attorney General's. I had no duties to hire or fire or administer or do anything. And so it was a wonderful time. I think there were about 100 lawyers at the um, Attorney General's office at that time. Is, do you think I'm about right? I, I think that's right. Yeah. Well, did you come in under uh, General Cody or General Mike Burson? Cody. Uh -huh. You came in under General Cody. Uh -huh. and, uh, and Knox Walkup was the assistant. Uh -huh. Wonderful people. Uh, Bill Leach had been Attorney General before, but he was through, gone into private practice. And then Burson came before I left. I was there eight years. Um, but, but most of the lawyers, I thought they were smart lawyers. I had no criticism of the lawyers in that office. But they were, the, the Attorney General's office was taking on um, a lot of trial work that they hadn't handled before. And a lot of these lawyers had no experience in trial work. And so you said mentor. I mean, if anything, I was there to help however I could. There were three areas where there was <coughs> litigation where there hadn't been before. One was uh, condemnations, mm -hmm. eminent domain. Uh, the Attorney General had always farmed those out to local lawyers in the county where the property was located. And Cody took them back and handled them internally. So there was all that work. Uh, and there was a lot of road building and school building and so forth. So there was a lot of condemnation work. And, and I could help with that. Then civil rights was a fairly new law. And a lot of... Uh, government employees decided that they had been wronged and they sued for their civil rights. Uh, teachers, for instance, who hadn't gotten uh, tenure uh, thought it was because of age or sex or religion or whatever and they would sue. And then, so there was that litigation. And then at the same time, the state waived it's governmental immunity for certain torts and contracts on a limited basis, but that opened up that much more. So there was a lot of litigation. And so I was, I considered myself there to help however I could, uh, maybe just to advise with somebody, maybe to go to a deposition with them maybe to take the deposition, maybe to talk to them about negotiating what the, uh, a lot of them didn't know much about negotiating. And um, so it was wonderful. Uh, and some I'd just try the whole lawsuit, mm -hmm. uh, but always with somebody. And so it was, uh, I would let them do as much as they felt able to do in every case. So that was, uh, that was eight good years of practicing. Eight good years. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The others weren't bad, but <laughs> they were eight good years. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Justice, Justice Geralda, who is, as I think almost everyone knows, your brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. And um, Frank got out of law school and then joined your firm. He did. Um, and I guess he had been there about five years. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but not a long time. He was still a young lawyer. And uh, Buford Ellington was governor. Frank Garrell was lieutenant governor. And Frank called me one day. Bill, uh, Buford Ellington doesn't like lawyers or judges. And he, <laughs> and he asked me to uh, 
help in filling vacancies. Judge uh, Alf Adams uh, was retiring from the bench, and he uh, and he says, "Bill, do you want to be judge of the Chancery Court?" Well, I didn't need to think about it at all. I'd sat as special judge for different judges when they were going to be out of town mm -hmm. or something, and I knew I didn't like sitting up there and being impartial. <laughs> I mean. I wanted to be on one side or the other, and, and I didn't. You were a zealous advocate. And, and to be quiet. I didn't want to sit up there and be quiet and listen to those lawyers say things I wish they'd hurry up with. So I said, no, Frank, I want to be an advocate. I don't want to be a judge. We said, who can I get? And I said, I don't know. I just didn't know. So it hadn't been long after that. My dad walked in the office, and... Um, I told him about this conversation. Dad says, well, what about Frank DeWalda? And I said, well, I think he's doing a good job for us, and I'm glad to have him here. And But I said, if you want to call Frank, you can, and um, it's just up to you. Well, he called Frank, and Frank's first reply, I was told, was, well, he sure is young, isn't he? But he did appoint him, and Frank went on to become judge of the Court of Appeals and later Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So he had a good retire, uh, good career, and is retired now. So. Um, now, before you left your uh, your law practice. Uh, that firm had expanded. I guess your father and Mr. Goodpasture, did they retire? Well, they did. Uh, and you mentioned Bill Woods. He was there. Bill Woods. The, the law firm had lots of other names. It was always Goodpasture and Carpenter. Mm -hmm. And then it had other names. Dale, Jim Dale for a while. Um, uh, then Dale and Woods. And then Mr. Dale left. And it was uh, Good Pasture, Carpenter, and Woods. And then there were other associates where Jim Sasser, before he ran for the Senate, was an, a, a partner. A and, partner. Uh, uh -huh. And Bob Parker was later. And so uh, Ward <coughs> Courtney was at one time. So, uh, but it didn't, our law firm didn't expand, it stayed the same size, basically. I mean, we had more associates than that. But I, I think all businesses, including law firms, have life expectancies. And ours just sort of disintegrated in a way. We, we all went our separate ways. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the law firm, you know, John Hooker's law firm, it, uh, different ones. Uh, mm -hmm. They either form with other uh, law firms. They change, and right. ours did. So. Well, your life has been a very valuable part of the history of of the bar. Well, thank and, you. And uh, I appreciate your taking the time for this interview. Any other comments you want to make about the practice of law? I can't think of anything. Well, thank you very much. This has been a very good interview. We appreciate thank you. this. Thank you.